declassified summaries of top secret intelligence documents, attempts to funnel a quarter million dollars, and what was said about the two Michaels. Stunning testimony from the Foreign Interference Inquiry is on the show this week. I'm Mercedes Stevenson, and the West Block starts now. This information now is in the public domain. The head of Canada's spy agency takes the stand revealing critical information about CSIS's concerns on what foreign operatives were up to in the last two Canadian elections. And on this somber anniversary of the Rwandan genocide, General Romeo Dallaire tells us key actors in that slaughter are currently hiding out in Canada. The public inquiry into foreign interference is back and it has been a big week. For the first time, we're learning the details of what intelligence exactly the government had on the issue. The director of CSIS and the commissioner of the RCMP both testified about significant and numerous attempts by foreign governments to interfere in our democracy. From propaganda to China's attempt to funnel about a quarter million dollars in cash to influence Canadian politics. And we learned new details about independent MP Han Dong and the comments he allegedly made about the two Michaels. A CSIS document alleged details of a phone call between Dong and China's Consul General in Toronto. Dong testified that he didn't recall making the statements about the two Michaels alleged in the CSIS report and said that he had always advocated for their early release. One thing was clear in all of it. China is highly capable and motivated when it comes to election interference. Joining me now to discuss this are former National Security Advisor and CSIS Director Dick Fadden and the Globe and Mail's senior parliamentary reporter Stephen Chase, who's broken a number of the stories on foreign interference. A really remarkable week in terms of a chance to see documents Canadians would typically never lay eyes on, to hear from senior national security officials about what was happening behind the scenes. Steve, I know you've been tracking every moment of this as it goes by. What jumped out to you this week? Well, what... First of all, what jumped out to me is that David Johnson really did a poor job. We learned so much more in one week of this inquiry than we've learned from his entire report. We had um, the, the revelations that there was uh, serious concerns about uh, Chinese you know, disinformation campaigns being uh, leveled against the Conservatives that were not passed on. We, we, we finally learned more about the conversation that Han Dong had with the Chinese consulate and the actual details of it. We had uh, revelations about $250,000 being uh, you know, delivered by the, from the Chinese government to threat actors in the region. So, uh, and the week's not even over. Uh, the, the inquiry's not even over. We've got another week going. And of course, we're seeing uh, public summaries of, of what would have been highly classified documents. We're not seeing the original documents or any of the things that we're not permitted to see for national security reasons. When you watch this through the national security lens, Dick, what does it all say to you about how significant this all was? Um, and things that we've learned, as, as Steve points out, through this inquiry that we otherwise never would have known and in some cases were denied by the government or by the Johnston report. I think the main conclusion that I come to, which I find very distressing, is given everything that's been made public this week or quasi-public this week, in the context of the government's clear reluctance over time to admit that there was a problem. I mean, the government had to be driven to set up this inquiry. I still don't think they've really registered how serious it is substantively. It's certainly important publicly and in communication terms, but the thing that came across to me mostly was all of this information, or most of this information, should have been available quite broadly, not all publicly, but broadly within the system. Certainly the political side of things should have known about it, as should the senior public service. And despite all of this, as I said a moment ago, the government was very reluctant to deal with the issue, and they still are. You know, Mr. LeBlanc has been promising a uh, foreign agent's registry now, I think, for about 18 months. Uh, this is not a complicated piece of legislation. Is there any way they wouldn't have known some of this stuff? Because when you look back on some of the things that the government said a few months ago, and now you look at what's before the commission, did they never see this? Did they see this and think it would never come out so they could continue along their path? Uh, there's some pretty glaring deficiencies in the public commentary compared to what we now know. CSIS is saying, yes, we, we had analysis that suggested this and that it would have been passed on to appropriate authorities. I mean, it's the job, for example, of PCO to make sure that when things like this come up, 
the Prime Minister and PMO and ministers are available. So I don't know why they've been reluctant to accept this in their public commentary, as you say, or to accept that they should have done something about it. But uh, I've certainly come to the conclusion, having worked in Ottawa for a goodly number of years, that nothing stays secret forever. And I would have thought that that would have registered as well, but it seemingly hasn't, because you're right, the contrast between what they've said and what now appears to be the case, not quite congruent. Steve, what's the political fallout of this for the government? Well, I think it, it shows that they weren't really uh, on the job. They were it, either there was a failure in communication or there was a deliberate decision not to share information about the extent uh, of, of the Chinese uh, foreign interference. And let's be clear, 90% of what we're talking about here is, is Chinese state foreign interference. Although we've added other countries to the roster, uh, we don't have a lot of evidence uh, of other countries uh, being as, as pervasive and aggressive. And it was the, the questions about China that initially sparked this inquiry. Of course, we've since started talking about India. Russia's been a persistent problem, Iran. Uh, it's a very broad scope, and I do want to get to that in a moment. But I wanted to ask you your opinion, Dick, on, on this information we got about the CSIS interception of the phone call between Han Dong and the Chinese Consul General. And this has been, uh, you know, a lot of controversy, a lot of debate about this phone call. We finally got the CSIS summary of what they allege was said, and it included things like uh, concerns that uh, you know the Canadian public wanted more transparency on on the two Michaels being held, which of course is true. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you have Han Dong in it suggesting that if the Chinese government were to provide more transparency about the detention, it might placate public opinion. It might give the Liberal government some talking points that if they were to release the two Michaels right now, uh, it in fact might embolden opponents of of the regime here in Canada and in the opposition who are hardliners on China. Um, that was quite interesting to take a look at. When you look at that as a national security official, do you think that's an appropriate conversation, if it unfolded that way, this is what CSIS says, if it unfolded the way that CSIS said it did? Well, I have no reason to believe that what CSIS said did in fact not happen. And no, I don't think it's appropriate. Um, you know, MPs are entitled to have relationships with, with embassies. I mean, socially and professionally to some degree. But I think we have to look at the context Canada was going through a really rough patch with China. We had two of our citizens being held. So anybody who was mucking around, complicating our relationships with China was doing so, I think, at variance with the best interest of both the country and the individual's concern. I understand why Mr. Handong would be concerned and he might want to help. It was not appropriate for a backbencher, in my view, at that time to try and play. Even if you attribute the most positive of, of motives to him, Anything that complicated what we were trying to do with the Chinese was not helpful. And Han Dong, of course, was up testifying this week, the, the first time that we've heard from him in front of the commission. What did you think of what Mr. Dong had to say? It was especially, um, I think, difficult for him when he was asked about these specific summaries of his conversation with, 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 the, with the consul. And he couldn't recall advising them. Uh, he couldn't recall saying that, or didn't remember whether he had in fact advised them to uh, that right now might not be a good time to release the Michaels or that it might embolden the, the hardliners. And he didn't recall uh, other, other very specific and, and tantalizing bits of the conversation. That didn't, I don't think that came across well. And there's of course the question of this $250,000 that CSIS believed this essentially, I believe the commission lawyer called it a slush fund, that they were hoping to funnel through sort of a network of intermediaries to try to affect the election. And it's not clear whether that money ever actually changed hands, but that there was a, an intention to do so there. I wonder, Dick, when I look at all of this, and, and CSIS had all of this information, and they say that they passed it on to CITE, which is the, the elections body that's supposed to be monitoring and warning if there's an issue. Why didn't we hear anything about this publicly at the time, given what we now know? I think that's a $57,000 question. I think there are basically three reasons. One, the way the uh, site was constituted, it put senior public servants in this role. Uh, one of the things you're taught when you're a senior public servant is you stay as far away from elections as you possibly can. It's part of the DNA. And I think they would have been reluctant intuitively to make these things public. Um, Secondly, I think um, the views of the Prime Minister at the time were that this was not a really significant issue. And I don't for a minute think that the Prime Minister told anybody, don't release things. But the views, the moods of ministers and Prime Ministers permeate the system. And I think that would have added a little bit to the reluctance. 
And the third reason, and I've felt this since the very beginning, I think I may have said this on one of your shows, I thought the constitution of SITE was wrong. Uh, I think that we would have been far better to have a retired politician, you know, uh, former Prime Minister Clark, he's not particularly partisan, but he's well respected. He understands elections in a way that none of these senior officials could have or I could have. So I think for those three reasons, in the end, the th I think the, the, the problem would have had to be so serious that they would have felt compelled to release uh, the information. The other issue, too, is I think their mandate wasn't as clear as it could have been. They interpreted it as requiring them to release information if there was a systemic issue, not if there was an issue, as Mr. O'Toole argues, at particular constituency levels. There was also an incident Friday that I thought was, was really telling. Uh, the Privy Council office, uh, a staffer for, from that office, uh, revealed that they would actually had, it, had uh, sort of intervened in the uh, 2019 election campaign and they'd asked Facebook to take down a, a false uh, uh, allegations, uh, an article that made really false allegations about Mr. Trudeau, um, a, a, a publication called the Buffalo Chronicle. At the same time, they were asked by commission staff, well, how come you didn't take any action with respect to WeChat? Uh, over the allegations that they made about Aaron O'Toole and uh, and Kenny Chu, one of the defeated conservative, now defeated conservative candidate, and they said, "Well, we felt one was more of a personal attack, and the other, it, it was not only it was in Mandarin, so it only would have really affected the Chinese-speaking uh, Canadians. It wouldn't have been didn't have the potential to go viral like the other article." Some interesting logic, and I'm sure we'll hear more about it in the Commission in the coming week as we start to hear from politicians, including the Prime Minister. So much more for us to talk about, including whether the Commission has enough time to do all its work. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we'll be back chatting about this again. Thank you both so much for joining us today. Good to be with you. Up next on a somber anniversary, is there hope for peace? It was 30 years ago today that the Rwandan genocide began. Extremists in the dominant Hutu tribe started torturing and slaughtering the minority Tutsis. It happened so brutally and at such an alarming rate, it was a clear attempt at wiping out the entire ethnic group. The total number of people killed was first believed to be 800,000, but bodies are still being discovered. In fact, another 100,000 victims have been unearthed in the last five years alone. Seven UN peacekeepers were also slaughtered on this day three decades ago. Canadian Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire headed the UN mission. His attempts at trying to shelter vulnerable locals without external help were valiant, but he could not stop the genocide. You are not to take sides. His first book about it sparked a Hollywood movie. Do they know how many people are going to die here? It's over. It's fini. His latest book, The Peace, A Warrior's Journey, explores the underlying causes of war and the need for more than band-aid solutions for a better and more peaceful future, something the world could certainly use right now. Retired Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire joins me now. General Dallaire, thank you so much for joining us. It's always such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you. As we reflect on the 30th anniversary of the beginning of such a, a terrible time in Rwanda with the genocide, one that stands out for so many Canadians as we watched in abject horror, as, as people lost their lives, hoping that help was coming that never materialized. You have been the face in so many ways of that pain and suffering here in Canada. As you reflect back on your time in Rwanda, and I know you were able to return recently as well, what is your feeling on this anniversary? Well, th there's enormous hope because the uh, generation that's uh, the young people are the generation post genocide now. And that nation is making headways beyond belief in becoming a modern, effective, sophisticated country. And so there's an enormous amount of optimism there. However, uh, the genocide remains a reference point uh, and the uh, tribulations around the non-resolution of the genocide. That is to say, the world not getting involved, the international tribunal not being complete, uh, and that uh, there's still some of the uh, uh, intellectuals that created the genocide are free in France still today, 
um, leaves a, a, a level of concern about something trying to be reconstituted again in the future. Well, the, the Rwandan government is pretty close to authoritarian at this time. In fact, there's been evidence of them trying to reach out and silence critics here in Canada. There's concern that some of those underlying issues that led to the genocide, as you mentioned, have not been resolved. Are you worried that it could happen again in Rwanda? There is a constant concern that because we've not truly moved towards human security and lasting peace, we are living in periods of truces, even after World War II. I mean, everybody screamed that we were at peace. The next day, we started up with the, war, with the Russians and the Warsaw Pact. So th there is a constant um, sort of acceptance that if we have a truce and we can work things out seemingly at certain levels, uh, that we will actually have peace. But we haven't reached that. We, we've never gotten to that depth. And so there's always a nagging concern that there are left uh, frictions that can, in fact, uh, regenerate the problem. And all the more so uh, when we know that there's activism to want to do that. Many of the bad guys of the Hutu regime ended up in Canada. And I've testified in one, one just one um, uh, trial there are other ones. And so there are movements outside of Rwanda that want to undermine the political process inside Rwanda. And so, yeah, I'm not surprised that there's concern about what's going on outside. Any diaspora that we have has connections with their old, old countries. And so there's nothing surprising that the two diasporas, Hutu and Tutsi, are here. And there are uh, elements that are uncer uncertain and unsatisfied. So if they're here, I assume the Canadian government knows they're here, are they not holding them accountable or attempting to deport them? When, when I was testified against one of the genocidae, uh, the trial was in Montreal, lasted nearly two years, uh, cost a couple million bucks. Uh, we had a list still then of people that should be brought in front of the, uh, the Canadian court because we have that international law that if we have people who have committed these crimes against humanity, we can try them here in Canada. And, and the Justice Department kept telling me that we don't have the money to be able to do the trials. And so these people are still living around, but they are not sitting uh, sort of uh, silent as they're not in Belgium, as they're not in France. And so uh, unless you bring justice throughout the process, uh, you're going to continue to have people who are getting away with it and will nurture this in the next generation. And that's the real concern, because the Eastern Congo is a hotbed of, of instability, and they would love to get rid of all the Tutsis that are in the Congo, let alone uh, their hatred for, for uh, Rwanda and the power that Rwanda has. That is horrifying to me that our Justice Department didn't want to hold or, or doesn't want to hold war criminals accountable over uh, a, a money issue. Uh, that just seems to be such a, a clear moral question there with a clear answer. I, I know that you've just written a book called Peace. And, and part of what you're looking at is this, this moral question of whether we are doing what we can to stop genocides like Rwanda from happening again. And I look around the world, I see October 7th in Israel, I see what's happening in Gaza, I see Sudan, Afghanistan, Ukraine, so many areas, and, and it seems like we are in a more complicated and dangerous time than we have been in decades. What can be done, what needs to be done to try to bring more peace to the world? I think that, uh, first of all, don't just think of the short term. We're going to have uh, these catastrophic failures still into the future. Remember that the nation states have only been existing for over three centuries, and we've been battling, you know, beating each other up and slaughtering each other ever since. And humanity has been doing it from the start, in fact, for, for power, for money and whatever. So there's going to be a need of a near revolutionary transition. And that's why I based my book on a lot of the Italian Renaissance, when they were able to create a revolution of thinking in humanity. And now that we can talk to all of humanity, all of it, I believe that the younger generations 
the, the, the millennials, the, the Zs, the As are going to master and mature the communications of the world. They're now already global. They're what I call generations without borders. They see things in a grander scale of things, both both the climate, both the, the planet uh, and humanity and bring it on. They feel that we can, in fact, uh, thrive into the future and not simply continue on this road with nuclear weapons and so on of surviving. The other angle that's coming into effect that is crucial is we got to get a hold of all these male dominated institutions and organizations and governance that have been built by men under their ego, under their, their often misogynist, under their uh, uh, self-interest based uh, uh, concepts of what is right and what should be. And we got to get the women to influence fundamentally the philosophies of leadership of the world. And that with the millennials, with the, uh, the uh, generations of borders, those two gangs together are going to change the face of humanity and move us beyond just thriving for peace, for truces, but actually looking for lasting peace. Uh, an inspirational message. Thank you so much for joining us today, General Dallaire. I know it's always a difficult anniversary and we appreciate your insight and your wisdom. Well, you're kind. Up next, revelations from the foreign interference inquiry last week that raised questions about the findings in the Johnston report. Now for one last thing. When it comes to foreign interference, the question is not just what other countries were up to in Canada, but what Canadian authorities and leaders knew, who they told about it, and whether they took the appropriate action to try to stop it. This week, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau will make a much anticipated appearance at the foreign interference inquiry. Global News asked Mr. Trudeau about CSIS intelligence summaries that were presented last week and whether former Liberal MP Han Dong would be allowed to return to caucus. We asked those questions in three different cities to the Prime Minister last week. And while he gave us a response, he did not give us an answer each time we asked. Obviously, these are ongoing conversations that need to be taken very seriously, and we are. This commission is an important moment for Canadians and for, uh, for our institutions. I think everyone is looking forward to uh, the work of the uh, independent inquiry into uh, foreign interference and uh, looks forward to seeing the commissioner's reports uh, in the coming months. I look forward to uh, taking all sorts of questions at the commission next week. We hope to get some clear answers from the Prime Minister at the inquiry about what he knew and when he knew it. That transparency is key to trust and to stopping future foreign interference. That's our show for today. Thanks for watching. We'll see you right back here next week.